Many of you know our guest speaker, Brother Wassam. Brother Wassam, he's a single man, 35 years old. He's a minister at the Sunset Church of Christ and a gospel preacher in the metro Detroit area. He was born and raised to a Sunni Muslim family in Baghdad, Iraq. He rejected Islam and embraced atheism in the mid-90s. He found a copy of the Bible in 1997, believed in 1998, but it took another 12 years before he could find someone to baptize him in May of 2010. He graduated from the University of Baghdad and worked as a civil engineer for eight years. A Christian woman invited him to come to the United States. He arrived in April 2011. Nine months later, he went to the Sunset International Bible Institute in Lubbock, Texas. He finished school and moved to Michigan by early 2014, and he began to work at the Sunset Congregation over here in Taylor. He enjoys reading, writing, and doing Bible studies. He also has his own Bible-based program to teach English to the Arab refugees. And I would encourage you, if you can, tomorrow night, invite your friends, invite everybody you know. This is a wonderful story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Amen. 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 I just love the way you Americans pronounce my home country. <laughs> I rock. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting enough that you pronounce the name of our dear neighbors, Iran. <laughs> Thank you. I am so excited to be here. I am seeing so many people from our, from many congregations in our church, some other churches. I can recognize some heathens among you too. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I'm here. Thank you. I would like to thank the Eureka Heights Church of Christ for allowing this opportunity for us to have this gospel meeting, the theme of which is Islam. Uh, we will be talking about Islam. Tomorrow, Lord willing, will be a myth-buster session about uh, the uh, religion of Islam and about the Muslim people and their beliefs and how they started. And uh, I do encourage you, if I, you have a, a smartphone or an iPad or a yellow pad or whatever, to uh, download a free Quran, go to your favorite uh, app store and download the Quran so you can uh, uh, trace or track the things. It will be a very informative session. Uh, that will be tomorrow. The day after tomorrow, Lord willing and Jesus series, we will be talking about how can we, that would be you, change that. And how can you preach the gospel to the Muslims and save souls and defend the faith. As I was preparing the notes for this uh, gospel meeting, a friend of mine on Facebook uh, posted an article. He actually shared an article from the CNN about a woman who converted to Islam. So according to the laws of physics, somebody filled the gap that I left when I left Islam, when I converted from Islam. That actually confused me. I mean, an article on CNN that is shared on Facebook, that must have been a good one. And uh, by this time, I kind of assumed that everybody knows uh, what Islam is all about and that it is not logical, it is not reasonable for people to convert into Islam. So I printed out the article. It's a four-page article that is called, I am a feminist and I converted to Islam. And I said, oh boy, I was about to call Michael and tell him to abort the gospel meeting. <laughs> The article is about a woman by the name Theresa Corbin. She's from Louisiana. And by the way, four pages does not have any reference to the Quran or the Bible. She has no idea what Islam or Christianity is. But listen to her conversion story. She was raised, she, she is the product of a Catholic and an, an Irish atheist. She grew up Catholic. Uh, when she was 15, she went to a mass in her Catholic church and she questioned her faith and the clergyman told her not to worry her pretty little head about it. So she did what any red-blooded American would do, the opposite. And then she converted from Catholicism, she became an atheist, and then she said, I found out about this strange thing called Islam. She converted to Islam one month after the 9-11 attacks. She said, the actions of the hijackers horrified me, but in its aftermath, I spent most of my time defending Muslims and their religion to people who were all too eager to paint a group of 1.6 billion people with one brush. I was done being held hostage by the opinions of others. In defending Islam, I got over my fear and decided to join my brothers and sisters in the faith I believed in. 
So she felt so sympathetic to Muslims, she decided to reject Christ and the life and the freedom and the love that is in Christ to embrace Islam for no reason at all and she has no idea what Islam is all about. She said, a Muslim lady told me that during a time when the Western world treated women like property, Islam taught that men and women were equal in the eyes of God. Keep this in mind tomorrow because we will be talking about that in detail. I have noticed that many cases of the conversions in Dearborn or in Metro Detroit in general among women was because another woman, a Muslim woman, told them that Islam uh, makes men and women equal and uh, elevates women and respects women. That is not true at all. And you will be seeing the evidence. Okay, it's not enough for us to just say this is true or not true. Uh, how can we make sure we, are, uh, we know the truth and whom do we believe? Of course, we have to go to the scripture of the Muslim faith. She also said, Islam turned out to be a religion that appealed to my feminist ideals. Good luck with that. <laughs> She was looking for an arranged marriage and she got it and then she said I am glad that Islam offered or afforded me this option. And then she said near the end of the article I came to know that Islam teaches disagreement and that shouldn't lead to disrespect as most Muslims want peace. That is not true. Actually Islam teaches that you should use violence to spread Islam into the whole world. We will be talking about that tomorrow. If you remember a few months ago, this man was on the news, five months ago. Elliot Roger went on a rampage and perpetrated a killing spree in Isla Vista, California, near the campus of his uh, college, the University of California, in Santa Barbara. He was not the first school shooter that we saw. He was unfortunately not the last one. But what's unique about this guy is that he made it known to the whole world what was in his mind, what was in his heart, what kind of struggles that he had that made him do this kind of attack. He uh, uh, wrote a manifesto and distributed it uh, to his relatives and he also made a video and posted it on Facebook. Uh, he called his video the Elliot Rogers Retribution and he said, well, this is my last video. It all has come to this. Tomorrow is the day of retribution, the day in which I will have my revenge against humanity, against all of you. And then we realized later that his main problem was that he did not lose his virginity at the age of 22. <laughs> Folks, this guy did not have God in his life. He had it all. He was a handsome young man. He had his whole life in front of him. He is shown here in a BMW. He was born to two uh, parents that were not Christians, but they were rich. His father actually is one of the directors of the Hunger Games movies. But without God made known by Jesus in his life, he lost the whole purpose of his life. And he thought that the whole world came to an end because he did not lose his virginity at the age of 22, which many of us uh, think that it is very young. And folks, this is only one example why people need Jesus. And we know that this is not the only guy. In fact, a few decades before him, another person had a similar issue. Sayyid Qutb. Born in Egypt in 1906, came to the United States. He also had it all. He was an educated man. He was rich. He had the support of his family and his country to go uh, to the United States to study, which is the envy of the whole world. He went to the Wilson Teachers College in Washington, D.C., the Colorado State College uh, for Education, and the Stanford University. And he visited many American uh, cities and uh, on his way back home, he also some uh, European uh, cities. He visited some European cities. And he had exactly the same kind of bitterness to the community for the same reason that Elliot Rogers had. But instead of committing a crime in the sight of the law, he wrote a book. That book is called The America That I Have Seen. And he was explaining why he was so upset with America, the, uh, the West and the United States uh, uh, specifically, particularly. He said uh, that he was critical of its materialism, individual freedoms, economic system, brutal boxing matches, poor haircuts, remember that was in 1948, which is an age that many of us uh, recognize as uh, conservative, less immoral than the time that we're living now, and he was still uh, uh, like uh, superficiality in conversations and friendships, restrictions on divorce. Man, that was the United States. 
enthusiasm for sports, lack of artistic feeling, animal-like mixing of the sexes, which went on even in the churches. And the quote is to him. And this book is very famous. And I will get to the point why I'm bringing this up. And his particular issue was with the American woman. He said that the American girl is well acquainted with her body's seductive capacity. She knows it lies in the face and in expressive eyes and thirsty lips. She knows seductiveness lies in the, and I uh, uh, apologize for not being able to finish what he said. This book became the inspiration for every modern day terrorist in the world. That book was the book that started the hatred to America among Muslims. Sayyid Qutb is a co-founder of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement. And by the way, his writing, especially that book, was the inspiration of people like Ayatollah Khomeini and Osama bin Laden, who was the leader of uh, Al-Qaeda, who was killed in May of 2011 by the Navy SEALs. Uh, he also <coughs> was a co-founder of the Muslim Brotherhood movement in Egypt. A movement that also gave birth to terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and even more recently, and I apologize for this brutal picture, ISIS in Iraq. Many people think that the interest in America, uh, uh, the interest in Islam and the American community started at 9-11, or shortly, probably before that, in the bombing of the two American uh, embassies in uh, Africa. But the truth of the matter is that the United States has been struggling and dealing with the Islamic terrorism almost ever since it became a country. In fact, the very first battle of the American Navy was against terrorism, the, uh, the Islamic terrorism, and the Islamic terrorists. And this is immortalized by the Marines' song from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Tripoli, as in Tripoli, Libya where the United States Navy was fighting the Muslim terrorists who were hijacking the uh, American merchant ships, <coughs> enslaving their crews, and demanding a high tribute from the government. President Thomas Jefferson refused to pay the high tributes demanded by them, the barbers, and uh, that uh, uh, started the first military conflict authorized by Congress that the United States fought on foreign land and seas. Uh, once again, I'm with Sam. I will be sharing my uh, story of how I converted uh, from Islam to Christianity. I have studied the Quran in Baghdad, Iraq, and I have studied the Bible in Lubbock, Texas, which means that I'm familiar with the both scriptures from the very resources. No, the Bible was not written in Texas, but you can. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, let me tell you this uh, funny story, a real uh, life story. Right after the Gulf War of 1991, I was uh, a, seventh, a seventh grader. And the school started the very first day when the school started after the war, which we took uh, like a two months uh, spring break, which was supposed to be two weeks, but because of the war, it uh, uh, was two months. Uh, they told us that a very brutal teacher of the Islamic education uh, class came and be very careful from him, because he's very brutal. <coughs> I was taking the school very seriously. I was the smart guy, the nerd in the school. So I said, well, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to read, I'm going to do all my assignments, and I do not have anything to be afraid of. That teacher, in his very first day, he said, whoever does not memorize the first, the second, and the third hadiths of Muhammad in the textbook, go stand in the corner. Everybody went, of course, because no one told us before. We did not have any school before that day, <coughs> except me. I was so afraid, I sat, and I sneaked the textbook, and I read and memorized the, the hadiths. And he gave every student 20 lashes with a very thick hose on their hands. And then he came to me, and he said, okay, read the first, the second, and the third hadiths. I read them. He said, explain them. <laughs> Go stand at the corner. <laughs> and he came to me and he pushed me with that thick hose on my chest. He said that our main teacher told him that uh, I was a nice student and that's why I'm not beating you up today. But don't do that again. Understand? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> my friend who enjoys telling this story over and over to tell everybody how chicken I was back then, said, Wassam came the next day memorizing the whole Quran and the Bible. <laughs> In April of 2011, 
a Turkish 737 like this one landed at JFK Airport. That plane had citizens from Turkey, some European countries, and one guy from Iraq who was about to experience a radical change in his life. A few days before that, I quit my job as a civil engineer, <coughs> in which I worked as a civil engineer doing water and sewage projects all over Iraq. I said the final goodbyes to my family. I came to this nation with one bag, with only enough mo for money for me to survive for weeks, half of which I paid my lawyer to apply for my asylum, and with no plan at all, and with only one contact. The planned part of the journey was a one-week tour in New York City. I was admitted as a visitor. The unplanned part, everything else. I came to this nation to be free, to worship the God I believe in, the way I believe is true. Only a few months after I came, I met over a thousand people who rushed to call me brother. I've had the perfect health, surprisingly enough, for the first time in my life, for the whole nine months before I went to school. I've had all my cares taken, uh, needs taken care of. And before I knew it, I went to a Bible school, and I graduated, and I came here, and I'm working here right now. Isn't God wonderful? Amen. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq, in 1979. And when I was born, bad things started to happen in the world. Saddam Hussein uh, became the president of Iraq, and Ayatollah Khomeini led the Islamic Revolution in the neighboring Iran. Most of you old folks remember the uh, Iranian, uh, the American uh, hostages crisis back then. Yeah. A few months after that, the war between the two countries started to last for eight years. That was my childhood. I was born and raised in a community where you're not told to love one another. Love, tolerance, forgiveness is completely stripped off the Muslim communities, and we had no idea what these values are all about. And that gave the chance to one person to scare a whole nation in every country. Shortly after the Iraq-Iran war, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. We had the sanctions that lasted for 13 years, in which we were living on one dollar a month, the whole family. And right after the Gulf War, there were two uh, revolts against Saddam Hussein. One of them was Kurdish in the north, and the other one was Shiite in the south. Up until that time, Saddam Hussein was secular. He was a military dictator after the manner of Stalin. But he realized back then that uh, putting the religious people to death did not work, and in order for him to avoid this thing from happening again in the future, he started to promote Islam. He wrote Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag. He ordered the Quran to be taught in all the Iraqi schools. He started to build hundreds of mosques all over Iraq. My father retired in 92, and my mother started to work as a tailor to provide for us, the family. She was the one who provided for me and my education. In the middle of the 1990s, it was very obvious to everybody in Iraq that Iraq was in enmity with everything that is different because of the religious uh, authorities and the government and the things that they've been put in our minds. We've only been fed what the government wanted us to know. We had two government-run TV channels, three government newspapers, and two government radio stations. And we were told that we were right, and everybody else in the whole world is wrong. Enmity, hatred, is what we were raised to. And by the way, the Quran promotes that enmity and promotes that hatred. We will be talking more about that in detail tomorrow, Lord willing. Everybody in Iraq, including me, uh, started to think that there is something more to life, and we had some emptiness that we did not understand. Most people were looking in the wrong places in the Quran, being distracted or kept busy keeping the Islamic rituals, praying five times a day, fasting every Ramadan, and that completely distracted them from seeking a personal God. We did not starve because of the lack of food or water, because of the sanctions, but we were starving for something else that we did not know. My sister, when she was four years old, died in 1996. Wow. My mother, a panicked mother who just lost her daughter, 
was begging for someone at the funeral to provide her with a glimpse of hope that that innocent child went to heaven. No one was able to provide her with that hope, and the only man who was knowledgeable in the Islamic law in the funeral told her she will be judged for the very first breath that she took in when she was born. A few months later, my uncle got cancer. And he was the uncle that I loved most. And I have a lot of uncles and aunts because both my grandparents had three wives each. For the first time, this uncle, whenever I asked him any question, he would not answer. He was sick and he was in bed and he would be crying, not only because he saw his death coming in a few days, which he did die, but because for the first time in his life, he was not able to go to the bathroom and get ritually clean and do the Islamic prayers that every Muslim is required to do five times a day, and if you miss one of them, then you have lost every chance with God. And he's been doing that since he was 10, and by that time, he thought that God was done with him. He died without hope. It's then when I started to think, what kind of God is that? And I decided to forsake religion, per se, and became an atheist. I still struggled with that vacuum, though, and I was looking in the uh, 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 wrong places for some kind of satisfaction. I thought I was happy that I'm an atheist. I mean, in Islam, basically everybody will be going to hell. So if I'm going to hell anyway, then what's the point of the Islamic piety that we had to do? I might as well enjoy the life that I have within the few available options that I have. And if I'm going there anyway, then if there is a God and I'm going there, there is nothing I can do about it. I learned English to try to discover the other sides of the stories that I've been told by the government. I started to listen to the few uh, available sh uh, static-free shortwave radio stations, and I started to read a lot of books, including these two books. And many of those books and the movies that I watched quoted from the Bible. Now, a Muslim is born and raised to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. But they think that this copy of the Bible is not the original Bible and it has gone or undergone corruption. I was an atheist anyway, so I did not care. But it is only because those books kept quoting the Bible over and over again. And it was then when Tom Cruise was on Mission Impossible, the first one, when he picked the Bible and read from Job 3.14. That was the time when I saw the, got to see the Bible for one second. And I got so curious, I decided to get myself a copy of the Bible. <coughs> In my second year in college, I went to a flea market in Baghdad, and I bought my first Bible. It was the Gospel of John. And I thought that was the whole Bible. I came back home to try to find those quotes in the books that I was reading about and match them with the Bible. I did not find any of them. I said, well, Muslims were right. Everybody is writing his own Bible. <laughs> Something caught my attention, though, in the Gospel of John. The way Jesus dealt with the hypocritical religious authorities of his time, calling them liars and hypocrites, something you're not supposed to do in the Muslim world. You know that your religious authorities are lying to you because what they preach is not, does not match your scripture, the Quran. And you're not supposed to question any man who has a turban on his head. But this Jesus spoke against the religious authorities in a religious book. I thought that was cool. Did not care, though. I threw the Bible away. I finished my second year in college. And in the summer holiday between the second and the third year, I was back in that same flea market flipping the New Testament. I saw the Gospel of John in the New Testament. That was the first time I realized that the Gospel of John is not another Bible. It is a part of a bigger book. So I bought the New Testament. A few days later, I realized that the New Testament is a part of another bigger book. I ran out of money. I borrowed money from my cousin, this guy who was killed in 2007 by an Islamic militia, and I bought my first complete Bible. And when you give the Bible for the first time to someone that does not have any religious background at all, especially any biblical background at all, there is only so much you can expect that person to understand from the Bible. The Bible that I had was not a study Bible either. It was a plain Bible, Smith Van Dyke kind of Bible. And I was so impressed with the historical and geographic information in the Bible, common knowledge where I came from. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar uh, as a national hero in Iraq. The Babylonian capti captivity, we learned that in school. I was like, wow, the guy who made up this book really knew his history and geography. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I did not understand anything from the Bible in terms of theology and doctrines and beliefs, though. And what does that? I enjoyed reading the Bible. I especially enjoyed the fact that that book promotes values that we really need. And the people in the Middle East and even here in Metro, in Metro Detroit, the Muslim communities really need, and they are not introduced to the forgiveness, the love, the tolerance. The third year in college started. I saw a man who is a Chaldean Catholic, and he had a very big cross on his shirt. I came to him, I said, sir, are you a Christian? He said, yes. I did not see him in the first uh, two years in college. He obviously <coughs> flunked the third year. <laughs> I said, I got myself a copy of the Bible, and I have some questions if, if you think you can answer me. He said, okay, go ahead. I said, do you Christians believe that you're saved by grace or by obedience? He grabbed me and took me aside like he's been waiting for someone to ask him this question his whole life. And he told me, God is a just God, and he wants to destroy us because of our sins. But he's also a merciful and loving God, so he sent his son to take those sins and die on the cross for us. That was the first time I ever hear the theme message of the Bible. I said, that's impressive. I only have one more question. He said, go ahead. I said, I know that the Western world, the smarter half of the universe is too smart to believe in a made-up book, but do you really believe that the Bible is not corrupt, is true? He said yes. And the next day he brought me some literature that talks about how many tens of thousands of manuscripts that we have of the Bible in the museums today that dates, back, that dates way back before Muhammad's time who approved the Bible that was available in this time. And how those manuscripts from all those countries from all those times and all those languages matched each other. That was the first time anyone tells me that the Bible is true. That's when I believed in the Bible. And I was so happy that that book that promoted a life that we needed is actually true. And I thought everybody else would be as happy. I was wrong. The first person I tried to preach the gospel to was my mom. Keep in mind, by that time, I have no Christian background at all. I have no idea what preaching is. I have no idea what to say and what's not to say. And I still had my struggles about the Bible versus the Quran thing. My mom would be crying every morning. She used to wake up every morning before me, even to the very last day before I came to America, to prepare breakfast for me. And in that time... She used to cry every morning, and she would not answer me when I told her, Good morning, Mom. I would say, What's wrong? And then she would turn to me and grab me by the collar and tell me, Please tell me, what did I fail to provide for you that you do this thing to me? I said, What thing? She said, I've been seeing the Bible among your college books. You've been doing this, reading this blasphemous book, and bringing shame and danger to the family. <coughs> I tried over and over again with her. I started to have some pressures from my friends. I started to lose a lot of friends and not gain many uh, new Christian friends. The religious authorities eventually knew about that and they came to our house to harass us in 1999. And I had my time when I thought to myself that was not a good idea in the first place. So I gave away all my Bibles. It took me only a few weeks to realize and to remember that the hope that I had when I believed and the promises of God in the Bible cannot be matched by the whole world and by this whole life. Yeah. <clears throat> so I got myself new copies of the Bible in English this time. And I continued to read the Bible in secret in English so that no one else around me can understand what I'm reading. There you go. And the main struggle that I had was that it took me 12 years going to every single church building in Baghdad trying to get baptized by people who did believe that you have to be baptized by the remission of sins. We have an Armenian person here probably. This is the biggest church in Iraq, the Armenian Orthodox building. And that was the second building that I wanted to be baptized in. 12 years. So, I finished my college in 2000. I finished my mandatory military service in 2002. I was employed in a job that I did not want doing. Uh, being a sanitary engineer doing water and sewerage projects 
And uh, the American army came in 2003. For the first time, we started to have the internet. I could go online and, and, and download some songs or sermons or uh, research some biblical uh, questions that I had in my mind. And everything continued to happen at the same pace until... In 2009, I was in my building, the Ministry of Public Works, making a phone call, and I was on my way from the second to the first floor, and as I was in the staircase, a truck bomb rocked our ministry building, and a second truck bomb rocked another building only a few hundred feet away, the Baghdad City Hall. I was in the middle of that pillow of smoke that was caught by an Iraqi soldier. <coughs> 1,500 people got either killed or injured in those two explosions. Many of them with minor injuries, they came to back, uh, back to work a few days later. And I came from it without a scratch. We moved to a substitute building in another place in Baghdad, and there was an internet cafe next to that building. I used to check my email every day after work, I used to pay a flat rate to use the internet for an hour, and it didn't take me more than a few minutes to check my email. And uh, by that time, I was already familiar with, with uh, uh, the Bible. I was reading the Bible every day, and I was listening to Christian songs every morning on my way to work with my MP3 player, putting the, the earphones in my ears. But I did not have any official Bible study, so I googled for a free Bible study, and I clicked enter. And I chose the first hit, and everything changed after that. By the way, the website did not look like that back then, because later I translated the website, the, the study, into Arabic, and I took a picture of the editor of this website baptizing his own daughter with my camera. A woman was assigned to grade my Bible tests. And in her very first email, she asked me, do you have any prayer requests? Prayer requests. Would you please pray that I can be baptized? Because I've been trying to do that for 12 years. And would you please pray that I can live in a Christian-friendly community where I can simply say Jesus is Lord without getting killed right on the spot? Amen. That same day, I was looking for Christian free books. And I came across a book called Bible Basics, written by a British man by the name Duncan Heaster who runs a ministry in Latvia. I ordered a free copy of that book. The guy answered me with an automated email introducing himself and his ministry, saying that he believes that everyone should be baptized for the remission of sins. Are you, if you're not baptized, I can come and baptize you. I said, thank you, sir. I'm from Iraq. Read the address. <laughs> He said, I am coming to Iraq to baptize you. And he came to Erbil in northern Iraq, booked a room uh, for both of us, paid for my bus ticket to go all the way from Baghdad to northern Iraq, and baptized me on May 26, 2010. Wow. And I do not like this picture because it added five pounds to me. <laughs> <laughs> That woman, who used to grade by uh, Bible uh, tests, was taking care of a quadriplegic man in the Amish country of Pennsylvania, in a Christian man's house. And she told him about me. And he told her, tell this Iraqi if he ever plans to come to the United States, there is a room in my house waiting for him. Amen. A few weeks after that, the American embassy in Baghdad started issuing visas for Iraqis for the first time in 20 years since the Gulf War. So I quit my job, said the last goodbyes to my family, got the one bag that I had when I came here, came to New York City, took the bus from Port Authority in Times Square to Reading, Pennsylvania, where that woman and the man, the owner of the house, were, was waiting, were waiting for me there. And they took me to live in that room in Rick's house in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. The Amish country. The least familiar part of the American life to every foreigner. I was in the woods. Nothing. <laughs> I applied for asylum. The government did not answer that uh, immediately. 
the money that I brought with me was getting less and less by the day. And I was looking to the return ticket. I could not even have the simple comforts and pleasures of going shopping or go to the barbershop without someone driving me all the way there. And then we had a singing event in Reading, Pennsylvania, where I met the first member of our church, Ivan Martin, of a black bumper Mennonite, if you recognize that term. An old man. He came to me and he said, Young man, what brought you all the way from Iraq to the Amish country? I said, Plane? <laughs> <laughs> He said, no, tell me the whole story, your story. How, why did you come here? And he would be the first one who hear the story that you're listening to now, up until that point. When I was done, he said, wow. You need to share that with my church, the Church of, Camp, the church of Christ in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. I said, sir, only a few months ago, I could not even go to church and sit in the back seat without raising some unnecessary suspicions. And I have never spoke in my second language in public. He said, you have to do that as a testimony for what God has been doing in your life. And he made me speak in his church. And when I was done, the preacher of that church, Doug Hamilton, who is uh, a graduate of the school that I graduated from, he said, why don't you go to a preaching school? I said, sir, I don't even know if it's legal for me to go to school in America. The only legal paper that I had back then was the letter from the American government that it's legal for me to stay there until they decide my case. And I do not have enough money to survive for another few days. He said, you go check with your lawyer, and we will start raising support money for you. And they started raising support money for me before they could pronounce my last name. <laughs> and before I knew it, I was in the school chapel in the morning in front of 200 people with the school president asking me what are my plans after I graduate, like I've been planning for this my whole life. I said, what plans? How did I get here? <laughs> and then I remembered that for years past back in Iraq, I've been praying only for the freedom to worship God. That simple thing that you are doing now, coming to church and sitting, was a luxury that I could not do. If I only had this freedom, I would be serving Him for the rest of my life. Every Christian has a gift, a talent, and God is expecting us to invest those gifts in His kingdom. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. My gift happened to be my Arabic and Muslim background. I told him, I plan to bring the gospel to the Muslim populations in the United States. There was only this small problem left of me being without a home congregation, being sim single, uh, being a foreigner, was the least expected person to get employed by a church. Until we had a substitute teacher in our school in Texas, Jerry Tallman from Rochester, Michigan who said, do you have any idea how many people there are praying for someone like you to come there? He connected me with the churches here. And I'm so glad and I'm so thankful that Brother Ted chose to be in a place where he can eventually get me all the way here. I am uh, a member of the Sansa Church of Christ now. I have my ministry to the Muslim world. I preach and teach to the Muslims and I cannot exchange that look on their face when they hear the words of Jesus for the first time with the whole world. Amen. And I'm also working in my own congregation. Preach the word. That's the only thing that we have. Mm -hmm. Defend the faith before somebody takes us from the Lord and takes the Lord from us. That's right. yeah. God is promising you that he will be with you all the days of your lives. This is not only for God's kingdom, but also for this country that provided me with all the care, the respect, and the love that did not exist anywhere else in the world. Well. Ronald Reagan said, you and me have a meeting with destiny. We will preserve for us this, man's last hope on earth. 
And that's what Jesus is all about. Unlike that woman who converted to Islam because, not because of any good reason, but because she felt so sympathetic and curious about Islam. Jesus relates to you. And he is calling you to have a personal relationship with him. The Bible says in John 10, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He goes on to say in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief, listen here, the thief, anyone else who wants to wants you to claim loyalty to, anyone else who wants you to be follower of, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said whom I preach to you today. I am the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Amen. Have you heard that message? Mm -hmm. You are a sinner, and you deserve the death penalty, and somebody else <clears throat> took that death penalty for you. Right. Do you believe in him? Yeah. Are you ready to trust him? Are you willing to accept his gifts, not only the eternal life, but here in this world? that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and you can see the glory of God working in your life. Do you want to be saved? Please step forward and be baptized and repent of your sins and confess Jesus as Lord as we stand at sacred.